From his appeal to conservative stereotypes and to his frequent attacks on gender theory, Jordan Peterson has been dominating the internet blog sphere for a while now. It's safe to say that the doctor loves voicing his opinions on the most controversial topics, even if he ends up getting flamed online for it. Today we're going to flip the script and place the psychologist on the therapy couch, so let's stop waiting around and see what he has to say. First off, Peterson recently came under scathing criticism for his views on climate change. Joe Rogan and Jordan Peterson discussed climate change in depth on a new episode of his podcast podcast. In a debate that made Rogan's previous anti-vax content appear scientifically solid enough to earn a Nobel Prize, Rogan and Peterson discussed climate change for about 30 minutes at the start of the four-hour-plus episode. We'll spare you most of the conversation since we want you to continue existing in a less aggravated state, but we still feel forced to talk about the craziest portions here so you can understand our pain. And oh boy, is it excruciating. Rogan starts the conversation by saying that he's been reading a book about climate change. He says that it's a tough read and that it requires a lot of thought. And Peterson answers with some of the purest, unadulterated brilliance we've heard in a very long time. Apparently, JP believes that climate isn't real. For the next few minutes, as they continued their absolutely insane exchange with the seriousness of libertarian college students as a debate club, Peterson asserted that climate models are untrustworthy because of flaws that compound over time, which which implies that these models are all errors. Trying to anticipate what will happen with the climate, he says, is akin to attempting to predict how your life will unfold. He also claimed that impoverished people are the true cause of climate change. The solar energy is more dangerous than nuclear power because workers jump from rooftops during installation and that fracking has not contaminated any water systems. Following that exchange, people got angry very angry. Leading climate scientists have slammed Peterson's remarks, calling them stunningly uninformed, and claiming that he has fundamentally misunderstood the basic premise of climate modeling. Peterson's depiction of how climate models function, according to Dr. Sarah Perkins Kirkpatrick of the University of New South Wales, Canberra, is embarrassingly false. While weather forecasts become less accurate as time passes, climate modeling is an entirely different thing. He seems to think we model the future climate the same way we do the weather. He sounds intelligent, but he's completely wrong, she said. Oh, and guess where did Peterson get his information from? In response to the critics, Peterson cited Hot Talk, Cold Science, Global Warming's Unfinished Debate by S. Fred Singer on Twitter as the source for his claims. Singer formed the Science and Environment Policy Project, a climate septic think tank sponsored by the Heartland Institute, backed by oil interest ExxonMobil and the Koch family. Singer was a bit of an extremist when it came to his views on the climate society, including calling human climate emissions trivial and criticizing the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is why widely regarded as the world's foremost authority on climate science and publishes peer-reviewed findings based on the work of the world's best climate scientists. Jordan Peterson's arguments aren't very different from Singer's or any climate change-denying empiricist. He commits the age-old climate septic fallacy of conflating weather with climate. It's basically like saying that we can't anticipate if a pot of water on a flame will boil since we choose which variables to include in our model in advance and can't forecast each bubble. Also, climate denial isn't JP's only controversial opinion. To no one's surprise, Peterson thinks abortion is obviously wrong, according to a lecture he gave last year. During his presentation, Peterson was challenged about the morality of abortion, and he criticized it as a universal evil that no one disagrees with. He said that the debate over the legality of abortion is nested inside a broader debate over the morality of abortion, which is nested within an even greater debate about the right role of sexuality in human conduct. And to JP, that's the level at which the problem has to be addressed. Peterson went on to suggest that Western civilization has to straighten up as misconceptions regarding the connection between men and women. Obviously, Peterson believes that monogamy and marriage are appropriate solutions to the rising concern. He argues, however, that the culture as it is now will never embrace this message. Abortion, according to Peterson, is a horrifying indication of civilization that has allowed men and women to drift apart. Moving on, if you're still not willing to wave the white flag, JP has a few other great hits in store for you, like how about the time when he said that white privilege didn't exist. He labels race and ethnicity as postmodernist. After after listing various factors such as health, wealth, age, economic standing, and so on. His own analysis converts the concept of white privilege into majority privilege. He thinks that's okay, so the Chinese are the dominant race in China, right? And the culture is designed to accommodate them. As a result, because whites are the majority in America and Canada, the culture is tailored to them. Whoever culture is created for is privileged by default. Otherwise, the creation would not have been worthwhile in the first place. For someone who is so obsessed with context, it's odd that he disregarded the fact that democracy is based on the context concept of a fair playing field. Sure, it's largely lip service, but it's still inspiring. Peterson claims that Marxists and postmodernists oppress us, but the true cause of regression is Peterson's inability to consider empathy. Maybe he's right that white men do not have to apologize for every wrong committed by their ancestors. 
but semantics aside, to believe that their sins did not rig the game on the land that we occupy is ludicrous. Now moving on to other news. Bursley Peterson just called the Albanese government delusional. He claims that the country's ambitious climate measures will devastate the country. JP called Australia a resource-dependent and productive country in a daily telegraph piece, dismissing its end-of-decade aim of 43% reduction in emissions as impossible. He stated that the Labour government's 2030 and 2050 ambitions are both absurd and unforgivable, both practically and intellectually. Peterson's comments come after the House of Representatives enacted the country's first climate change legislation after a decade. The climate change bill was approved by a vote of 89 to 55. Part of this law includes two national greenhouse gas emissions objectives, one of which calls for a 43% decrease in 2005 levels by 2030 and a net zero reduction by 2050 in accordance with the Paris Agreement. According to the Sydney Morning Herald, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese applauded the bill's passage since it will bring long-term security to the country while producing numerous means of employment. It doesn't sound like something Peterson should be exactly salty about, to us at least. Also, this isn't the only way Australia is trying to contain the climate crisis. The Act will be the first jurisdiction in Australia to prohibit the sale of gasoline and diesel vehicles from 2035. Shane Rattenbury, Minister of Emissions Reduction, stated that the new laws will apply to new vehicles, motorbikes, and small trucks. Their intention is that people will not be able to put new cars on the road after 2035. However, if you're driving around in an all-petrol vehicle at the start of the year, the government has no plans to pull it off the road. The Act government plans to get the ball rolling sooner, guaranteeing that by the end of the decade, 80 to 90 percent of new light cars sold would be zero-emission vehicles. Under the Sustainable Household Scheme, the state government now also offers interest-free loans of up to $15,000 to qualified households interested in purchasing electric cars. While Canberra is the first state to put this strategy into action, other governments are anticipated to follow suit. In addition, the federal government has provided financial incentives to encourage individuals to go electric. According to The Age, Anthony Albanese has joined a legal challenge in the High Court to repeal Victoria's quirky car tax. Last week, Attorney General Mark Dreyfus filed an intervention in court in favor of two motorists seeking to overturn the Victorian EV road user tax. According to reports, the Commonwealth government would want to collaborate with Victoria and the other states and territories on electric car policy. JP is going to flip when he finds out about this. And lastly, chasing politicians with a pitchfork might be Peterson's new hobby. According to Dr. Peterson, climate change fanatics aren't just your average run-of-the-mill virtue signalers, but are made up of xenial and narcissistic political types who govern by the will of the public. People are rightly concerned about environmental sustainability, according to Peterson, and ill-informed politicians who are in it for the narcissism are willing to accommodate the public's anxieties. The narcissist under question is, you guessed it, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. In an interview with Lex Friedman, Dr. Peterson criticized Trudeau for his authoritarian tendencies, narcissism, and confrontation with farmers in his pursuit of green programs. That, according to Peterson, is not how a representative of democracy is meant to act. Well, look who's talking. That's a wrap of this video. Do you agree or disagree with Jordan Peterson's claims? Let us know in the comments below. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. See you in the next one.